some consideration of the three angels' messages. Um, if you look closely at the writings of Ellen White, you'll find that she says more than once in a variety of ways that many of the men that are proclaiming the three angels' messages do not even know what the three angels' messages are. So there is inspired record that there's misunderstanding about what the three angels' messages are in Adventism. And I would contend that it doesn't this seem a little bit loud? No? no. Okay, okay. I would contend that there are men in Adventism that are very restricted about their definition of the three angels' messages, and they perhaps are the ones that Sister White is speaking about. But we're going to look at some characteristics or principles, some rhythms or patterns within the three angels' messages that aren't typically noted this evening. But by the end of the week, you'll see that they are important. Uh, last night, we looked at the the fact that every reform movement parallels every other reform movement. And this first quote is kind of, it goes along with that from the Ministry of Healing, page 441. There's a study of history that is not to be condemned. Sacred history was one of the studies in the school of the prophets. In the records of his dealings with the nations were traced the footsteps of Jehovah. So to, today we are to consider the dealings of God with the nations of the earth. We are to see in history the fulfillment of prophecy, to study the workings of providence in the great reformatory movements, and to understand the progress of events in the marshalling of the nations for the final conflict of the great controversy. That's, uh, we were looking a little bit at the reform movements last night under the premise that all those lines brought together will illustrate the events at the end of the world, not only of how the Lord raises up the 144,000, but also will describe what takes place in the nations of planet Earth. And this next quote is um, the quote we used last night as our point of reference from Great Controversy 343. The work of God in the earth presents from age to age a striking similarity in every great reformation or religious movement. The principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. The important movements of the present have their parallel with those in those of the past and the experience of the church in former ages has lessons of great value for our time. Last night, we put a line up and began to show that the way marks of every reform movement are the same. Um, they all possess a time of the end, the time of the end for the Millerite time period was 1798 with the fulfillment of the prophecy identifying the papacy receiving a deadly wound. It's at this point that the first angel arrives in history. The book of Daniel is unsealed. Um, sh shortly thereafter in the flow of time the Lord has used William Miller to understand the first angel's message to the extent that it becomes a testing message for that generation. It's, it's formulated to the extent that the Lord can hold that generation accountable for that message. Then in 1840, August 11th, 1840, the Lord confirms that message by bringing down the Ottoman Empire right on time in fulfillment of a year-day time prophecy, thus verifying that the Millerites had the correct understanding of the year-day time prophecy. From 1840 onward, the message now is not only formulated where this generation could be held accountable for it, but it's empowered. The, the, the year-day principle is the argument um, that the Millerites are using to predict the end of the world. The world has seen that it works with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the test is underway. We are told in Testimonies Volume 1 that by June of 1842 the Protestant churches begin to close their doors against the Millerite movement and this is the arrival of the second angel's message. I think I've pointed out here once um, before I'm going to point it out again 
the second angel's message goes through history until the summer of 1844 when the midnight cry arrives. The midnight cry here is where the second angel's message is empowered. On, in 1840, the first angel's message has been empowered. That's what those little squiggles mean. This is the first angel's message here. This is a characteristic of all three messages. <clears throat> the third angel's message arrives in history on October 22nd, 1844, because at that point, God's people can look into the Ark of the Covenant by faith, understand the Sabbath, understand the distinction between Sunday and Sabbath, and the third angel's message is a warning about the Mark of the Beast, Sunday enforcement. So the third angel's message arrives in history here, and it continues on until the end of the world when it's empowered when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down. The point I want you to see first off, again, I know we've been through this before, is each of these three messages first arrives in history and then later is empowered. Second angel's message arrives in history, later it's empowered. Third angel's message arrives in history, later it's empowered. Now this is important to note because this is the Millerite history, and we know that the Millerite history is repeated. So when we're looking at the repetition of the Millerite history, as illustrated in Revelation 18, these characteristics will be demonstrated again, and in order to understand them, it's good to understand them right here from the start. What the, when the Lord works a reform movement with nations or people or individuals, he does it through the working of his Holy Spirit, and the work of the Holy Spirit is a three-step process. You'll notice in your next quote, under sin, righteousness, and judgment, John 16, verses 7 and 8 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, when the Holy Spirit is come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. The first angel's message was a warning message that convicted that generation of sin. That's the first step of the Holy Spirit. In the second angel's message, righteousness is manifested at the midnight cry. And at the third, rather the third angel's message, judgment takes place. This is the three-step work of the Holy Spirit. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. First angel's message, second angel's message, third angel's message. <clears throat> You'll notice from Desire of Ages, dealing with this work of the Holy Spirit, 671, it says, of the Spirit, Jesus said, He shall glorify me. The Savior came to glorify the Father by the demonstration of His love, so the Spirit was to glorify Christ by revealing His grace to the world. The very image of God is to be reproduced in humanity. The honor of God, the honor of Christ, is involved in the perfection of the character of His people. When He the spirit of truth has come. He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. The very honor of God, the very honor of Christ is connected with these reform movements because these reform movements are governed by the three-step work of the Holy Spirit. And every reform movement parallels the other reform movements. William Miller brought a message that convicted that generation of sin. And Sister White compares William Miller with John the Baptist. John the Baptist brought a message that convicted of sin. And Sister White compares William Miller with Elijah. And Elijah brought a message that convicted of sin. In the second way mark of John the Baptist's history, at the midnight cry, righteousness is manifested. In the, the second 
phase of Elijah's story, in here you have fire coming down out of heaven and consuming Elijah's offering. And fire is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit coming down out of heaven. Heaven is an illustration of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that took place at the midnight cry, took place at the triumphal entry. In the story of Elijah, immediately thereafter, the prophets of Baal were judged. In the story of Christ, immediately after the triumphal entry, he was crucified. He was judged. He would, Satan was judged. Immediately after the midnight cry, judgment arrives. Three-step work of the Holy Spirit. Convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Underneath that next, that last quote, you have Psalm 77, 13, that says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? In the courtyard, you have the conviction of sin illustrated. From the courtyard in the sanctuary, you move into the holy place where sanctification or righteousness is represented. And from there, you move into the most holy place where glorification or judgment is illustrated. The three-step work of the Holy Spirit runs through every work of God's that's identified in the scriptures, but it is the the, the pattern that all these reform movements are governed upon. <clears throat> Angels. I'm going to put another ball in the air for you. We're switching gears here. Prophetic angels. If you, any, in, you know, I, have, I was having a discussion with a brother last night, and, and, and he and I had two different ideas about prophecy, and we weren't, we weren't combative at all, and I'm just using this to, to make a point, not about our discussion, but to make a point. I have found that those of us in Adventism that are trying to understand the book of Revelation, if we don't recognize and acknowledge that inspiration has told us that the angels in the book of Revelation represent the work of God's people, then we come up with some really crazy ideas about what the angels are. But inspiration is clear that the three angels of Revelation 14 and the two angels of Revelation 18 and the angel of Revelation 10, that they represent the work of God's people. When you, when you understand that, then you begin to see this history differently than if you're looking for some divine being. So we'll read a couple of quotes to put in that in place if you're not familiar with it. Life Sketches 429. I have had a precious I have had precious opportunities to obtain an experience. I have had an experience in the first, second, and third angels' messages. The angels are represented as flying in the midst of heaven proclaiming to the world a message of warning and having a direct bearing upon the people living in the last days of this earth's history. No one hears the voice of these angels, for they are a symbol to represent the people of God who are working in harmony with the universe of heaven. Men and women, enlightened by the Spirit of God and sanctified through the truth, proclaim the three angels' messages in their order. The angels represent the work that the people of God accomplish. All right. For instance, as one example, in 1798, we're going to deal with this a little bit more tonight. In 1798, the first angel arrived in history. But in 1798, at the time of the end, the book of Daniel was unsealed and there was an increase of knowledge. So in 1798, the work of God's people is represented by the first angel and the work for God's people in 1798 was to run to and fro in God's word and to understand the increase of knowledge that was taking place. The fact that the first angel arrives here is saying that this is where the work of God's people begins in connection with understanding the increase of knowledge concerning the coming judgment. Okay? Another quote. Psychological Messages, Book 3, page 405. The third angel is rep represented as flying in the midst of heaven, symbolizing the work of those who proclaim the first, second, and third angel's message. All are linked together. We're going to deal with this in a moment about being linked together, but when Sister White uses the word link, she's using it, her common terminology is a link in a chain. She talks about 
you know, history, prophecy, being linked together like links in a chain. So when she says the three angels' messages are linked together, she means they can't be separated. They can't be separated. Pardon me? Connected. They're connected. Also, they're identical. A link, generally a chain, the links are all identical. But um, It's like the Messages Book 3, page 412. The first two quotes she's talking about the three angels messages of Revelation 14. Now she's going to talk about the angel of Revelation 18. Did you get your handouts? They're back there on that table. Another angel is to come down from heaven. This angel represents the giving of the loud cry, which is to come from those who are preparing to cry mightily with a strong voice. Babylon, the greatest fallen, has fallen, has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful, hateful bird. So the angel of Revelation 18 is representing the proclamation of the loud cry. And then, then there's another quote on that angel from 1888 materials, page 926. John saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the whole earth was lightened with his glory. That work is the voice of the people of God proclaiming a message of warning to the world. So when we see angels in Revelation 14 and Revelation 18, what are they representing? The work that the people of God do. So, how many angels are in Revelation 18? There's two. Let's go there very quickly so you can see that. Usually in Adventism we're not familiar with that. <clears throat> but in verse 1 of Revelation 18 it says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory and he cried mightily with a strong voice. What did he do when he came down? He cried mightily. This angel cried mightily. Now look at verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying come out of her my people it's not the same voice it's another voice but it's a voice of an angel right so you have two angels in Revelation 18 in Adventism we call Revelation 18 the fourth angel's message but if you're going to get technical there's two angels there and in Revelation 18 the history of the, the Millerites from 1798 to 1844 is repeated and there are two angels in this history. The first angel, the second angel. This history ends with the arrival of the third angel. So when Revelation 18 has two angels, and we're going to show that it's repeat, a repeat of this history, this would be the first angel of Revelation 18. This is, this is the first angel all the way through here. And in 1840, there was a mighty angel that came down out of heaven. So the first angel of Revelation 18, he's going to be the one that comes down out of heaven, right? And then there's another angel, come out of her, my people. Okay, and the come out of her, my people, is the technical fulfillment of the loud cry. I mean, I'm not going to argue with anyone if they want to say the loud cry begins in verse 1 of Revelation 18. But in verse 4 of Revelation 18, you have the Sunday law in the United States. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is purified. The Holy Spirit is poured out without measure upon those people that have the seal of God. And they proclaim, come out of her, my people. Come out of Babylon. The eleventh hour workers are called out in verse 4. It's the loud cry. And what it is doing is it's paralleling the midnight cry right here that took place in the work of this angel. If you, if you see these angels as representing the work that the people of God do, it begins to make it easier to break down these repeated histories. Now, it's important in my mind to make another point here. I've said it more than once already in the first few days on purpose to try to get you acquainted with it if you're not already acquainted with it, and perhaps you are. But Uriah Smith in this next quote is going to state a correct pioneer understanding. And the pioneer understanding is this, that the first angel of Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, the first angel arrived in 1798, and then when the angel in Revelation 10 came down in 1840, it's the same angel. The pioneers understood that and they taught it. Same, the, the first angel of Revelation 14 is the identical angel of Revelation 10. 
And that's easy to understand because the angels aren't angels. They just represent the work that the people of God do. A two-step you know, a, a two work between the first and second angel's message. But in the history of the first angel, you have the arrival and the development of the message and then the empowerment of the message. So let me read this long quote from Uriah Smith. The chronology of the events in, of Revelation 10 is further ascertained from the fact that this angel is identical to the first angel of Revelation 14. The points of identity between them are easily seen. Everyone know who the first angel of Revelation 14 is? Say amen if you do. Is there some of you back there that didn't say amen? And turn to Revelation 14.6. Let's at least read it through if, if we're not familiar with it. Revelation 14.6 says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made the heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. That's the first angel. The next verse says, and there followed another angel. The next verse is the second angel. So the first angel of the three angels is Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. And if you go to Revelation 10, verse 1, it says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And what Uriah Smith is telling us here is this, this angel in Revelation 10.1 and the angel in Revelation 14.6 and 7 that we call the first angel, that they're the same angel. So let's go back to his quote again. The chronology of the events of Revelation 10 is further ascertained from the fact that this angel is identical with the first angel of Revelation 14. The points of identity between them are easily seen. They both have a special message to proclaim. They both utter their proclamation with a loud voice. They both use similar language referring to the great creator as the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and the things that are therein. And they both, both proclaim time, one swearing that time should be no more, and the other proclaiming that the hour of God's judgment has come. And if you drop to the very last short paragraph after he deals with this. Now, I better read the long paragraph. I almost missed a point. Um, but the message of Revelation 14.6 is located this side of the commencement of the time of the end. When's the time of the end? 1798. It is a proclamation of the hour of God's judgment come and hence must have its application in the last generation. Paul did not preach the hour of judgment come. Luther and his co-judders, judders, someone know how to pronounce that? Co-judders? Judas did not preach it. Paul reasoned of a judgment to come indefinitely future, and Luther placed it at least 300 years off from his day. Moreover, Paul warns the church against any such preaching as the hour of God's judgment has come until a certain time. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3, he says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him that you not that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us as that the day of the Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, etc. Here Paul introduces to our view the man of sin, the little horn, the papacy, and covers with a caution the whole period of his supremacy, which, as already noticed, continued 1,206 years, ending in 1798. In 1798, therefore, the restriction against proclaiming the day of Christ at hand ceased. In 1798, the time of the end commenced, and the seal was taken from the little book. Since that period, therefore, the angel of 14 has gone forth, proclaiming the hour of God's judgment comes. Since what time period? Since 1798, first angel arrives. And it is since that time, too, that the angel of chapter 10 has taken his stand on sea and land and sworn that time shall be no more. Of their identity, there can be no question, and all the arguments which go to locate the one are equally effective in the case of the other. Now, when we get to Revelation 18 on Sabbath, 
then you'll see why it's, it's worthwhile to make sure you understand that the work that begins here is empowered here and it's the same work, same angel. And that, that's a pioneer understanding. So, we've identified this, these three messages, these three way marks that appear in every reform movement. And we're saying that they're built upon the, the threefold work of the Holy Spirit to convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. We want to add one more component here now. And that these three way marks are three tests. All right? And this is important to understand because in each of these reform movements, there are three tests. And, there, and inspiration is clear. They're, they're not simply three tests that are unrelated to each other because these things are linked together, right? And these three tests are of such a nature that if you don't pass the first test, you're not involved with the second test. But if you pass the first test, you can come to the second test and you can flunk it there. Or you can pass the second test and flunk the third. But if you don't pass the second test, you're not even involved with the third test. That's the, the way these tests are described throughout scripture. Okay, So that, that's what we're going to be looking at here. Evangelism 613. And many are doing the same thing today in 1897 because they have not had an experience in the testing messages comprehended in the first, second, and third angels' messages. Now this next quote She's going, to, she's going to tell us that in this history there is three tests from Manuscript Releases, Volume 16, page 270. Many who heard the first and second angels' messages thought they would live to see Christ coming in the clouds of heaven. Did they? Did the Millerites live to see, the, to see Christ coming in the clouds of heaven? Most people are saying no. Some people are saying yes, and some are saying yes and no. Did they see Christ coming in the clouds of heaven? How many of you think yes or no? Yes and no. Okay, there's two yes and no's, three yes, three yes and no's. How many believe no? More no's. How many believe yes? Okay, we're getting off the subject here, but go to Daniel 7.13. Daniel 7.13 says, everyone there? Say amen when you're there. How's that? Okay. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of, of heaven, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him here before him. When was this fulfilled? On October 22nd, 1844, Christ came with the clouds of heaven into the most holy place. And the Millerites were alive when that took place. Because the Millerite history is a type of the history of the 144,000. And Christ came in the clouds right here, prophetically, prefiguring his second coming at the end of the world. What did you just do? Huh. Good. Daniel 7.13 Daniel 7.13 And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And we have a quote from Great Controversy. I think we may get to it tonight where Sister White identifies that as being fulfilled on October 22, 1844. Many who heard the first and second angels' messages thought they would live to see Christ coming in the clouds of heaven. Had all who claimed to believe the truth acted their part as wise virgins, the message were ere this had been proclaimed to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. But five were wise and five foolish. The truth should have been proclaimed by the ten virgins, but only five had made provision essential to join that company who walked in the light that had come to them. The third angel's message was needed. The proclamation was to be made. Many who went forth to meet the bridegroom under the first and second angels refused the third angel's message, the last testing message to be given to the world. These three messages are three tests. The third is the last. All right. Now this history is prefiguring the perfect fulfillment of the three angels' messages at the end of the world. But nevertheless, these are three tests. 
A similar work will be accomplished when that other angel represented in Revelation 18 gives his message. Now she's talking about Revelation 18 here, isn't she? Notice what she says. The first, second, and third angel's messages will need to be repeated. The call will be given to the church, Revelation 2 through 5. So the first, second, and third angel's message will be repeated in Revelation 18. The mighty angel of Revelation 18 is going to appear in history at the end of the world at the time of the end. His message is going to go through history. And then in verse 1, he's going to come down out of heaven. And then in verse 4, the other voice, the second, the second part of this, these two steps here takes place. And it's pretty easy to see. It's pretty easy to see. The message that comes into history at the time of the end, in our day and age, is in 1989 with the collapse of the Soviet Union fulfillment of Daniel 11 verse 40. All right, that's the time of the end. And it goes through history until the message is empowered on September 11, 2001. This message is always worldwide. Was there anyone in the world that didn't know about 9-11? No. When, when the mighty angel of Revelation 10 came down in the Millerite history, when Sister White comments on it in the Great Controversy, she, the thing she notes more than anything else, she says that when the Ottoman Empire collapsed on August 11th, 1840, the thing that it did the most was confirm the rules of prophetic interpretation adopted by William Miller and its associates, and the primary rule that they adopted was the year-day principle. So when the Ottoman Empire collapsed on August 11th, 1840, the primary rule that the Millerites was using was confirmed before the world. But the primary rule that's used here in prophecy at the end of the world isn't the year-day principle. The primary rule of Bible prophecy that's used to understand the message at the end of the world is that the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter at the end of the world. That's what all these, these parallel reform lines are teaching. All these reform lines are illustrating the history of the 144,000. And on September 11, 2001, the mighty angel came down out of heaven and it confirmed that it came down out of heaven at the same place that it came down out of heaven on August 11, 1840. Because on August 11, 1840, the fulfillment of the 391 year and 15 day time prophecy was when the four great European powers put a restraint on Islam. And on September 11, 2001, no matter who you think brought down the Twin Towers, immediately thereafter, George Bush went to the United Nations and they put a restraint on Islam. And it was demonstrating that the Millerite history was being repeated to the very letter, confirming the rule that is the very most important rule for the prophetic understanding here at the end of the world. And Millerite history is repeating. And we read a quote, whether you remember it or not, I emphasize this, it's on the tape, if you think I'm making it up. But Sister White says that the second angel's message was fulfilled where? This was worldwide. In, in August 11, 1840, she says the first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world. It was a worldwide event. It's always worldwide of it with this way, Mark. But the second one, it's always local. And she says the second angel's message was fulfilled where? In the United States. And the second angel's message, what was it? It was the Protestants of the United States closing their doors against the Millerite message. Of course, that's what's illustrated here. Because on 9-11, you can confirm that Millerite history is being repeated to the very letter. And the next thing to happen is that the Protestants of the United States closed their door against the message at the Sunday Law. And in the second angel's message in the Millerite history, then you had the midnight cry. And at the Sunday Law, you had the loud cry. And the midnight cry concluded when judgment opened, and the loud cry concludes when judgment ends. Absolutely airtight. Parallel. We're going to go over that more and more. I'm going through it now quickly to try to get it settled into your mind. They closed over there, so we're going to turn it down. Okay. A similar work will be accomplished. That's good. That's better for me. A similar work will be accomplished when that other angel represented in Revelation 18 gives his message. The first, second, and third angel's message will need to be repeated. The call will be given to the church. Take each verse of this chapter and read it carefully, especially the last two. Brothers and sisters, the last four verses of Revelation 18 are verses that are illustrating the close of human probation. The last four verses of Revelation 18, she points us to the last two, but if you look closely at the last four, this is when Michael stands up and human probation closes. 
it's in verse 21, 22, 23, 24 that probation closes for mankind in Revelation 18. We'll deal more with that later. Then in the last paragraph, she says, the parable of the ten virgins was given by Christ himself and every specification should be carefully studied. A time will come when the door will be shut. Please notice, in this quote, and this isn't the only place she does, huh? She's talking about the history of the Millerites, the first, second, and third angel's messages. That's Revelation 14. And then she tells us that the history of the Millerites is going to be repeated in Revelation 18. She's tying Revelation 14 and Revelation 18 together. And, and she's not done there because now she ties the parable of the ten virgins into this history because the parable of the ten virgins was fulfilled to the very letter in the history of the Millerites and it's fulfilled to the very letter here at the end of the world. And when she gets all done with that, what she emphasizes more than anything else, she says, read the final verses of Revelation 18 because there is where the close of probation is marked. And then she quotes from the parable of the ten virgins and, and says, the time will come when the door will be shut. But you will not believe the resistance I've, ha I've received in Adventism when I've taught the prophetic message over the last 15 years because Adventists, they don't want to hear that, that the message is identifying the close of probation. But that is our message. That's what we've been raised up to do, to tell the world that probation is about to close. And all these studies, that's what they're emphasizing, and we don't want to hear it. We don't want to hear it because we're Laodiceans and we're halfway comfortable living here on planet Earth right now. But prophecy is identifying that probation is about to close. And the close of probation is a purposeful, specific subject of prophecy. And if you're afraid to grasp that, you're never going to get the punchline of prophecy. That's what it's about. How the Lord finishes the great controversy. And when he does so, probation closes. Review and Herald, August 19, 1890. I'm often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. And if you've read The Great Controversy, you know that Sister White talks about the Millerite history, puts it in the context, uses the stories from the parable of the ten virgins to illustrate the Millerite history. The tarrying time, the first disappointment, the, the disappointment of 1843 is the tarrying time of the parable of the ten virgins. The midnight cry in the summer of 1844 is the midnight cry of the parable of the ten virgins. On October 22nd, 1844, the door was closed in the holy place and the door was closed in the parable of the ten virgins. Has been fulfilled to the very letter, but will be fulfilled again to the very letter in our day and age. Okay, because Millerite history is repeated to the very letter. And it illustrates Great Controversy 393, the experience of the Adventist people. On the bottom of page 3, it says, After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. I was shown the interest which all heaven had taken in the work going on in the earth. Jesus commissioned a mighty angel to descend and warn the inhabitants of the earth to prepare for his second coming. Are you, are you reading along with me? I, was, I confused myself. I, when, when I had this printed, some of the attributes of how I had it set up were lost. This quote jumped. It was supposed to be on the next page. Revelation 18 was supposed to stand by itself. And what I wanted to tell you about, this is, this is the mighty angel of Revelation 18, okay? And the characteristic of the first angel of Revelation 18 is when he comes down, the earth is lightened with his glory, right? Okay, keep that in your mind because here in this quote that begins right underneath it, I was shown the interest which all heaven had taken in the work going on upon the earth. Jesus commissioned a mighty angel to descend and to warn the inhabitants of the earth. I'm not going to read this whole quote from early writings, but I'm going to tell you what it says. She's describing the first angel's message, the second angel's message, and the midnight cry of the Millerite history. When you read through it, I put the whole quote there so you can read through it. In this passage, she's talking about Millerite history, but notice what she says about the first angel. Earth to prepare for his coming. As the angel left the presence of Jesus in heaven, an exceeding bright and glorious light went before him. Now she's speaking about the first angel that arrived in 1798. And she says this, I was told that his mission was to what? Lighten the earth with his glory. That's what Revelation 18 says about 
its angel, but Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, it doesn't say that the first angel is going to lighten the earth with his glory. It says, that angel cried, gave the everlasting gospel and cried out, fear God, give him glory for the hour his judgment is coming. What I'm saying is, Sister White is here telling us that the first angel of Revelation 14 is a parallel, it's a type of the angel of Revelation 18. When the first angel came down out of heaven, in 1840, his mission was to lighten the earth with his glory. Am I losing you? <laughs> okay, not yet. Okay, all right. Um, now here, Sister White says we should read Revelation 18 and consider, especially consider the last two verses, all right? Here's the last four verses of Revelation 18. Under the, under the subtitle, last two verses. We'll read them and then I'll try to explain what I'm saying here. And a mighty angel took up a s stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great, s great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman of what's, whatever craft he be shall be found any more in thee, and the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee, and the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of a bridegroom and of the bride shall be, no, shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for thy, by thy sorceries, sorceries were all nations deceived, and in her was found the blood of the prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Now, if you go to Revelation 18, in verse 1, we read this earlier, there's a mighty angel that comes down out of heaven and the earth is lightened with his glory and he cries mightily in verse 2 that Babylon is fallen. And then in verse 4 there's another angel. Another work begins and that angel cries out, come out of her my people. And Sister White's clear and we should know it even without Sister White. The call to come out is the call to bring the 11th hour workers out of Babylon to come and stand with God's people. So my point is in verse 4 probation is still open. Because there's a call being given, come out of her. Alright? So when you get to verse 21, where we just read, where we just read verse 21, it says, And a mighty angel took up a stone. What I'm saying is, verse 4 of Revelation 18 is the Sunday law in the United States, and verses 4 to 21 is the crisis that confronts the world during the Sunday law testing time period, and the crisis ends in verse 21 when human probation closes. Okay, so from, from verse 4 to verse 21, you have the Sunday law crisis. And it's worth seeing that. It's almost essential to see that as you move through this study. Now, in verse 21, it talked about, a, it's talking about Babylon. Revelation 18 is about Babylon. And it talks about a stone being thrown um, into the sea. Notice Jeremiah 51 in your notes. And Jeremiah said to Sarah, When thou comest to Babylon, and shalt see, and shalt read all these words, then thou shalt say, O Lord, thou hast spoken against this place, to cut it off, that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but that it shall be desolate forever. And it shall be, when thou hast made an end of reading this book, that thou shalt bind a stone in it, and cast it into the midst of the Euphrates, and thou shalt say, Thus shall Babylon sink, and not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. In verse 21, what's being illustrated there is the end of Babylon, the close of probation. In the next verse, one of the things that it talks about is um, the light of a candle, and in Jeremiah 25, verse 9 and 10, it says this. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring, him, bring them against this land. And brothers and sisters, this is a real important verse. Because all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. And the land that Nebuchadnezzar is going to come up against is the land of God's people. And Nebuchadnezzar is the king of the north. And the king of the north is going to conquer the world at the end of the world. And the king of the north in the last six verses of Daniel 11 is the papacy. This is a prophecy about the papacy. 
king of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing. Is that what we understand? Is that the whole world is going to be forced to receive the mark of papal authority? That's what's being described in these verses. And perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, and the, and the sound of millstones and the light of, the, of a candle. This is talking about the close of probation for Babylon. It's a prophecy. She's going to come to her end with none to help. So when you get to verse 21 of Revelation 18, what's being described is the close of probation. And after Sister White in that previous quote mentions the parable of the ten virgins and says a time will come when the door will be shut then she also points us to Revelation 18 says study every word of this chapter especially the last two telling us that we need to understand when probation closes in order to to unravel the sequence of events Manuscript releases volume 16 Page 270, the parable of the ten virgins was given by Christ himself. And every specification should be carefully studied. There's a lot of specifications in the parable of the ten virgins. And we're told by inspiration to study them all. But notice what inspiration emphasizes. A time will come when the door will be shut. Okay, the close of probation is a subject of prophecy. And it's an important subject. You can see Matthew 25.10 when the door is shut in the parable of the ten virgins. And the door was shut. On October 22nd, 1844, in fulfillment of Daniel 8.14, the door into the holy place, but at the same time, the parable of the ten virgins was fulfilled, and 49,950 foolish virgins from the Millerite history continued to pray to the holy place, and Satan began to answer their prayers, and 50 moved into the most holy place with Christ. The door was shut. In that history, the door gets shut in our history. In fact, in this history... How many times does the door get shut? Twice. Right? The Protestants closed their door right here, did they not? And then there's a door that closes down here. So in our history, there's going to be two close, closing doors. right? And what do we know? We know our history at the end of the world is, is the closing up of, of judgment. In fact, our history, the Millerites announced the opening of the judgment of the dead and we announced the opening of the judgment of the living. And when the judgment of the living comes to a conclusion, there will be two doors that are closed. Where does judgment begin? The house of God. The door closes on Adventism first. In here. Then for the world here. It's reversed. It's reversed from the Millerite history. Um... And the door closes on Adventism at the Sunday Law. Notice Review and Herald, June 15th, 1897. And remember that verse 4 of Revelation 18, there's another voice that says, Come out of her, my people. When those who have had abundance of light, who is it that have had abundance of light in the terminology of Sister White? Seventh-day Adventists. When those who have had abundance of life throw off the, the restraint which the word of God imposes and make void his law, others will come in to fill their place and take their crown. Oh, that the people of God might know the time of their visitation. There are many who have not yet heard the testing truth for this time. There are many with whom the Spirit of God is striving. The time of God's destructive judgment is a time of mercy for those who have had no opportunity to learn what is truth. The time of God's destructive judgment begins at the Sunday Law in the United States because she says more than once that national apostasy is followed by national ruin. That's a time of God's destructive judgment, but it's a time of mercy for those that have ne had no opportunity to learn what the truth for that time is, and the truth for that time has to do with the law of God and Sabbath and Sunday. Ha have Seventh-day Adventists had opportunity to learn that truth? <laughs> okay. Tenderly will the Lord look upon them. His heart of mercy is touched. His hand is stretched out to save, while the door is closed to those who would not enter. Nunner in Testimonies, Volume 997, Signs of the Times, November 8, 1899, says, None are contem condemned until they've had the light and seen the obligation of the fourth commandment. But when the decree shall go forth enforcing the counterfeit Sabbath, and the loud cry of the third angel shall warn men against the worship of the beast and his image, and the line will be clearly drawn between the false and the truth, then, when? If you, if you, you, there's a little principle in the spirit of prophecy it's nice to watch for. It's the when and the then. 
over and over again, she uses the when and the then in a statement. She'll say, when this, 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 this happens, then this will happen. And she just said, when the decree shall go forth. What decree is it? When the Sunday law shall go forth. Then the last sentence. Then those who still continue in transgression will receive the mark of the beast. But that can't be, ad- that can't be non-Adventist. Because non-Adventists, they're not, they're not going to be judged by the light at, at that time. They haven't had the light. She's talking about Adventists. When the Sunday law arrives, Adventism is the one that's held accountable for the light of Sabbath and Sunday. Yeah. Revelation 18 points to a time when it's the resu- as the result of rejecting the three-fold warning of Revelation 14, 6 through 12, the church will have fully reached the condition foretold by the second angel and the people of God still in Babylon will be called upon to separate from her communion. This message is the last that will ever be given to the world and it will accomplish its work. When? Those that believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness shall be left to receive strong delusion and to believe a lie. Then, then, when, when Seventh-day Adventists receive the strong delusion of Second Thessalonians, because that's what happens to Seventh-day Adventists, because they did not have a love for the truth that was unfolding at that time. Now, brothers and sisters, that, I know that comes across strong words, but in a moment we're going to read, a, Lord willing, a passage from early writings where Sister White talks about the history of Christ. She talks about a threefold testing process in the history of Christ. Early writings, page 259. She says, those that would not receive the message of John the Baptist, that was the first message in the history of Christ, they could not be benefited by the teachings of Jesus. They flunked this first test. She says, those that flunked that test went still further and crucified Christ, which prevented them from seeing their way into the heavenly sanctuary. And as she concludes the thought of that history, she says that Jews were left in perfect darkness. And in the very next paragraph, she describes a threefold testing process in the time of the Millerites. And she says, those that would not receive the first angel's message could not be benefited by the second angel's message, neither were they benefited by the midnight cry, which was to teach them the way into the most holy place. They continued to direct their useless prayers to this, the apartment that Christ has, had left, and Satan, pleased with the deception, answered their prayers. So, in the history of Christ, and every reform movement is the same, the people that flunked the test, they're left in perfect darkness. In the history of the Millerites, the people that flunked the test are praying to Satan. And in the history of the 144,000, those that flunked the test, they receive strong delusion because they did not receive the love of the truth and therefore they believe a lie. And this quote says, when those, when those that believe not the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness shall be left to receive strong delusion and to believe a lie, then... The light of truth will shine upon all whose hearts are open to receive it. And all the children of the Lord that remain in Babylon will heed the call. What's the call? Come out of her, my people. The Sunday law is Revelation 18 verse 4. And that's when God's children in Babylon are getting called out. And therefore, before verse 4, before verse 4 of Revelation 18, those of us in Adventism that have refused the unfolding light that the line of tribe Judah is delivering to us, we're going to receive strong delusion before the Sunday law. Because the Sunday law, brothers and sisters, Sister White says more than once, particularly in connection with the parable of the ten virgins, she says this, character is never developed in a crisis. It's only demonstrated in a crisis. And the Sunday law is the crisis. The Sunday law is where you and I as Seventh-day Adventists, if we're still alive, are going to demonstrate whether we have a character prepared for the mark of the beast or the seal of God. But we're going to prepare either of those characters before the Sunday law. Because characters never developed in the crisis. If I've developed a character for the mark of the beast before the Sunday law, it means that I've fully rejected the influence of the Holy Spirit, cast aside every opportunity for salvation, and before the Sunday law, I'm going to receive strong delusion. When those in Adventism received the strong delusion of 2 Thessalonians, then the 11th hour workers that are still in Babylon will heed the call of Revelation 18 verse 4. So we're making some distinctions here that maybe it isn't sinking into (laughs) quite yet, but Lord willing, if you're here all week, you'll see the point. 
verse 4 of Revelation 18 is the Sunday law. Therefore, when the mighty angel comes down out of heaven in verse 1, it's a historical event that takes place before the Sunday law. Has to be before, right? Next quote, angels were sent from heaven to aid the mighty angel, and I heard voices seem to sound everywhere. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partaker of her sins, and you receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. This message seemed to be in addition to the third message, joining it as the midnight cry joined the second angel's message in 1844. The glory of God rested upon the patient waiting saints and they fearlessly gave the last solemn warning proclaiming the fall of Babylon and calling upon God's people to come out of her that they might escape her fearful doom. The light that was shed upon the waiting ones penetrated everywhere and those in the churches who had any light who had not heard and rejected these three messages obeyed the call and left the fallen churches. In the history of the Millerites, the first angel's message arrives here, it goes through history, it's empowered here, and then when the Protestant churches close their door, the second angel message arrived. Here she's saying that when the Protestants of the United States close their door at the Sunday law and the message now has come out of her, my people, she says this message is joining the third angel's message. The third angel's message starts back here. The, this, the third angel's message is Revelation 18 verses 1 through 3. Verse 4 is the second step in the process of that history. If you read that quote carefully, you'll see that. And especially if you remember that angels represent the work that God's people do. Okay, It's an illustration of the step-by-step -step process. You guys watching our time so you can... Three minutes and, you, and your tape runs out? Okay. Uh, we're on the verge of a, a, another important concept, so let's read this. Select the Messages, Book 2, 118. The prophet said, I saw another angel come down from heaven. This is Revelation 18, verses 1 and 2. And then she quotes, and then she says, This is the same message that was given by the second angel. When Jesus began his public ministry, he cleansed the temple from its sacrilegious profanation. Among the last acts of his ministry was the second cleansing of the temple. So in the last work for the warning of the world... Three distinct calls are made to the churches. Two. In the history of Christ, there was two temple cleansings. And in the, in the work at the end of the world, there's going to be two distinct calls that are given to the churches. Now notice what she says. The second angel's message is, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And in the loud cry of the third angel's message, a voice is heard from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Okay? There's, there's a two-step temple cleansing in the history of Christ. There was a two-step cl temple cleansing in the history of the Millerites. And there's a two-step temple cleansing in the history of the 144,000. Now, how, how many have read the Desire of Ages? Desire of Ages? Have you read it? Okay, then, then you remember. How did Christ cleanse the temple? Hey, uh, 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 both times. Oh, the, the, the whips turn over the tables. So, yeah, but that's not how he cleansed the table. Pardon me? His presence. His presence. That's closer. Sister White says, divinity flashed through humanity. That's what cleansed the temple. When, when the, the people in the temple saw divinity flash through humanity, then what did they do? They ran out. Okay. So in the cleansing of the temple... What, what cleanses the temple is a manifestation of the power of God and then the people flee. Okay? And on August 11th, 1840, a mighty angel came down out of heaven empowering the message of the hour and there was a manifestation of divinity and humanity and the people began to flee and by 1842 the door closed. Then in the midnight cry there was a manifestation of the power of God as the Holy Spirit was poured out on the Millerites and the people began to flee and in 1844 the door closed. Okay, it's a manifestation of the power of God. At the end of the world, there's a manifestation of the power of God when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down. And by verse 4, the Sunday law arrives. And those people that have fled out of the temple of Adventism by verse 4 are gone. And when the Sunday law arrives, the church is purified and the Lord pours out the Holy Spirit on a, on a purified Seventh-day Adventist church. There's another manifestation of the power of God. And the people begin to flee until the door closes when Michael stands up and human probation closes. There's two temple cleansings in each history. 
they're accomplished by the manifestation of divinity and humanity, then there's a fleeing that takes place. And when we bring the Millerite history, that line into it, we see that when the door closes, the temple's been cleansed. Follow the logic? Even if you haven't tested it yet. It's, it's Let me read one more. But we, let's take our break now, probably. Brother Leo, you want to have a prayer?